It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bonnie Britton. She is a professor in the Department of Communication Disorders. She earned a BA from the University of Utah, an MA from San Jose State University, and a PhD from the University of Utah, all in speech language pathology. Before coming to BYU, she held a faculty appointment at the University of Nevada, Reno, and a research appointment at the University of Kansas. She joined the faculty at BYU in 1991. In addition to teaching and research, she has served in several administrative capacities at BYU, including associate dean in the David O. McKay School of Education and dean of graduate studies for the university. Professionally, Dr. Britton has been very involved in the American Speech Language Hearing Association, serving on national committees as program committee member for the annual convention seven times, and as a reviewer and associate editor for their professional journals. As a scholar, Dr. Britton has published numerous chapters and articles and has co-authored two textbooks in collaboration with her husband, Dr. Martin Fujiki, also a faculty member in the Department of Communication Disorders, her research has focused on the social competence of children with language impairment. She was one of the first scholars to document the fact that children with language impairment often have difficulty understanding and regulating emotion. Her latest work has focused on developing interventions to help these children overcome their problems with social communication. Dr. Britton has received several awards for her work. In 1999, she was named a fellow of the American Speech Language Hearing Association. In 2004, she received a BYU David O. McKay Research Fellowship. And in 2011, a BYU Carl G. Mazur Research and Creative Arts Award. Well, I could go on and on about her professional life, but I want to share a couple of personal things. I asked a couple of her colleagues to share some insights about Bonnie. One wrote the following. I describe Bonnie as the smartest person I know. She is wise, witty, and compassionate. She understands human nature, cares about individuals, and is an enthusiastic advocate for the disadvantaged. We are very fortunate to have her as a friend and a colleague. Another wrote, quote, there are two really important questions I ask myself every time I am faced with a professional dilemma, student concern, socially awkward situation, or an ethical issue. Those two questions are, what would Jesus do? And what would Bonnie do? I find that when I can answer those two questions reasonably and honestly, I am always guided to take the proper course of action. On an even more personal note, I learned that Bonnie loves to travel, particularly to San Francisco. She collects antiques, particularly dolls, and she likes to cook and eat out. Even though neither of her parents had the opportunity to attend college, they instilled the importance of education in Bonnie and her siblings which she and her husband Martin have carried on with their own children. Daughter Amanda is a fourth year medical student at the University of Utah, and their son Bob is in his first year of a PhD program in speech pathology at Purdue University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bonnie Britton. Well, that was a lot better than I deserve. <laughs> all I have to say about that. <laughs> I'm really honored and humbled to be asked to speak at a symposium named for Elder Neal A. Maxwell. I'm also terrified. I recognize that I am a very unlikely candidate to give this address, and I know it may be a surprise to many that I'm here this evening. Rest assured, it's a huge surprise to me as well. I have been asked to draw from my own experience as a professor and a researcher to describe how being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ has informed our scholarly endeavor. As I've considered the past Maxwell lectures, and I very anxiously pondered what I was going to say tonight and how I could add that discussion, all that I have is my personal story to share. And as I thought about this talk, a bit of Alma 37 and 33 kept popping into my mind. By small and simple things are great things brought to pass. 
Years ago, my husband Martin Fujiki and I chose this as our family flagship scripture because it reminded us that even small and simple individuals and actions and insights can make a meaningful difference. We felt that the scripture applied equally to our personal and to our professional lives. Now, as Marianne said, Martin and I are um, life partners as well as research partners, so this is an all-purpose scripture for us. And tonight, I would like to offer three small and simple principles through which being a disciple of the Lord has guided and sustained our work. The first is trust the Lord. The second is focus the work. And the third is let insight flow both ways. To introduce the first principle, trust the Lord, as we have come to understand, let me tell you a little story. As Dean Prater uh, said, our daughter Amanda, an alumnus of BYU, is currently a fourth year medical student. And we were all beyond grateful when she was admitted to medical school. And she felt that on receipt of this great blessing, she needed to consecrate her effort in this program to the Lord. Toward the end of her first year, Amanda, along with several of her classmates, was invited to give a panel presentation to undergraduates who were pre-med students. One of the members of the audience asked the panel members how hard they had to study to pass their medical school courses. A couple of Amanda's classmates responded rather glibly that they didn't find the word work terribly difficult and they didn't really study that much. When they passed the microphone to Amanda, she said, well, I'm not as smart as those guys, so I study a lot. Very early in our careers as professors, Martin and I looked around at the distinguished and productive scholars in our field. As we did so, we became keenly aware of the fact that we were not as well prepared, we were not as well connected, we were not as well resourced, we were not as capable, and we were simply not as smart as those guys. That was not modesty, that was just fact. So in that context, how are we gonna make a contribution? especially considering that all of our, our colleagues were working as hard as we were. The answer came in decisions that we made in our personal lives. As newlyweds, Martin and I had secured positions in the same academic department. Now, this was phenomenal because we have exactly the same research specialty and expertise. So finding two positions in one small department was a miracle in and of itself. The downside was the jobs were not ideal. They were very demanding. We worked a 12-month contract. We each taught three different, different classes each semester. We supervised many student clinicians and practicum. We spent at least one day a week in clinical assignments, and we were expected to do additional clinical work to demonstrate our expertise as speech-language pathologists. At the same time, we really wanted to do research because we loved it, and it was expected for tenure. So we worked all day at the university, and we worked every night at home until about 11, as well as all day every weekend. And that's how we initiated our research program. But we found that with this schedule, we couldn't do much of anything else. And at the time we were married, my bishop had challenged my husband, Martin. Now Martin's a college convert, and he had been inactive for almost 10 years when we married. And the bishop challenged him to begin attending church with me. So then we had a dilemma. How are we going to balance our work with the time and commitment required of an active Latter-day Saint? Could we really expect to do meaningful scholarly work given the demands of our job and the time and energy that's required for serious church activity? Well, after much thought, we decided that if we were going to be members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, then we were going to be members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And that we would just have to trust the Lord to make things work out. Now at the time, this was a real leap of faith, especially for Martin. I think back very tenderly of how hard it was for Martin to come back into church activity. Initially, it did not feel right to him at all, and he was very uncomfortable even being in church. And I can remember meeting with a counselor in the stake presidency one Sunday morning, and the counselor called Martin to be secretary of the elders quorum, even though Martin was not an elder. Uh, Martin looked at him and he said, I'll do this, but you need to know that I don't believe all this stuff. The council on the state presidency just looked right back at Martin and said things like, do you know that Episcopalian spelled backwards is Pepsi-Cola? <laughs> For whatever reason, the counselor chose not to hear Martin's anti-testimony and Martin was called as Elder Quorum Secretary. <laughs> when Martin says he'll do something, he does it. 
He took this commitment seriously, fulfilling all assignments and going the extra mile whenever he could. Over time, Martin's commitment bore fruit, and I can remember another Sunday morning a few years later when Martin and I met with the state president. This time, Martin was a Melchizedek priesthood holder, and he was called to serve as Elders Quorum president. The spirit that attended us both on that day was so strong, it was almost palpable. Martin's commitment had resulted in a lasting conversion, as well as in faith and spiritual gifts that I could never have imagined. But what about the research? Bit by bit, step by step, step by step, we moved along. We worked with some brilliant students who helped us. Somehow we were able to accomplish some things, although it was always hectic and it was never smooth. Through our church activity, we found friends who supported us and spoiled us with kindness. We were blessed with stamina. We learned how to work together to balance and juggle everything we needed to do. And that was a huge blessing because a couple of years later, we were blessed with a baby boy. Just as it seemed impossible to manage a child and everything else, we were, against all odds, offered full-time research positions at the University of Kansas. And that's a prestigious institution in our field. Our time at Kansas was instrumental in sharpening our skills, shaping our research focus, and preparing us to join the faculty at BYU. And those years also brought us a baby daughter. The bottom line is, we are not, and we have never been, as capable and smart as other researchers in our field. But we don't have to be. All we have had to do is to do our best and trust the Lord. He has filled in the gap sufficiently to allow us to make a contribution to our discipline. Now, learning to trust the Lord had one particularly critical byproduct for us. Because we knew we needed help, we were anxious to learn from anyone the Lord might send our way. We tried to learn from others as we peppered scholars and clinicians in our field with questions whenever we had the chance. This was especially important to us because the issues that we wanted to investigate crossed back and forth into several disciplines outside of speech-language pathology. And as I'll explain in a few minutes, the direction of our work has been a bit controversial, or at least unexpected, within our field. So the peer review process has been, shall we say, interesting. Let me just state that over the years, when our work has been reviewed for publication, it has rarely been an ego-gratifying experience. We learned that when we received reviews on a research article, there were a couple of strategies we could employ. As strategy number one, we could take the positive comments, mentally pat the reviewers on the back for their keen discernment, dismiss any negative comments as benighted, bemoan the short-sightedness of the reviewers, present an argument detailing how we were right, and then look for a less rigorously reviewed journal. <laughs> or as strategy number two, we could examine the negative comments carefully, change what we could in the current study, acknowledge and explain the weaknesses, and plan how to construct a stronger study next time. Trusting the Lord guided us to rely on strategy number two, and it has made all the difference in our work. We have often said that we have learned more about research from peer reviewers over the years than we ever learned from our doctoral programs. Let me give an example. A few years ago, we conducted a study looking at a complex social behavior in children with language impairment. This was a behavior that had received very little attention in this population, so it just really hadn't been looked at before. The results we obtained could best be described as dicey, just really messy. And we didn't know what to make of these results, and we were disappointed. So we sat on the data for a while thinking about it, and then we decided we've got to write this up. So we wrote it up, and we sent it off to a good journal and hoped for the best. The article was flat out rejected, and that hadn't happened to us for some time. Phooey. The article had been carefully reviewed, however, and we read those reviews closely, and here's what we learned. There was a small body of literature in a different field of study examining a similar behavior in typically developing children. The similar behavior was referred to as something else, however, so we had not found it in our literature search. When we dug into that literature, we found a framework that fit our study. And within that framework, our results made sense and our findings were interesting. We reconsidered our data within the new theor theoretical framework. We rewrote the article, and we sent it off to an even better journal. And it was accepted. The entire process was a blessing. All in all, the review process has been a fire for us, blistering in the moment, but greatly refining in the end. What we learned from this process is that, academically speaking, it does not matter who is right. What matters is what is true. 
we have found that occasionally feedback is neither accurate nor constructive. Often, it's painful. But almost all of the time, there are helpful truths in the review process. Brigham Young taught us to be willing to receive the truth. Let it come from whom it may. No difference, not a particle. It takes trust in the Lord to stifle one's ego and subdue one's pride, to listen to feedback, and to figure out what is true. But that's how we learn something new. So trust the Lord, not just in one's personal life, but also in one's academic life. It is a small and simple principle through which great things do come to pass. The second principle is focus the work. For an academic, it's a luxury and a blessing to focus one's inquiry in an area of interest. This allows us to deepen our understanding of phenomena. At the same time, focus is a necessity in terms of developing a coherent program of study. As university professors, we're busy, especially here at BYU. We need to focus in order to have the most impact. But how does one develop a focus? And this is a highly individual decision in which each scholar must make a practical application of Elder Dallin H. Oaks' counsel to consider what is good, what is better, and what is best. As I indicated, we're speech-language pathologists, and like many fields, speech-language pathology covers a lot of ground. Speech-language pathologists provide services for children and adults presenting with a variety of disorders and impairments of communication. These might include developmental disorders, language impairments, speech production disorders, fluency disorders, voice disorders, feeding and swallowing disorders. We work with a wide variety of populations, including individuals with intellectual impairments, developmental delays, autism spectrum disorders, craniofacial anomalies, neurological impairments, diseases, traumatic brain injuries, and so on. And although we prepare our master's level clinicians to serve individuals with a broad range of challenges, as researchers, we just have to specialize. Our specialty area within our field is language impairment in children. But this in and of itself is a really broad area of study. Let me just briefly describe language impairment. A child with language impairment may not look or act differently from other children as a baby. Subtle differences in very early development are sometimes evident only in retrospect. The first most obvious manifestation of language impairment is that a child usually does not begin to talk when other kids do. Those first words that most kids produce around 12 months tend to develop very slowly. Young children with language impairment may not understand what is said to them, and they may not respond well to parents when they talk to them. When a child does not respond to a parent in the way that the parent expects, the child may be difficult to interact with. And anyone who's ever had a conversation with a typical two-year-old knows that you have to provide a lot of support to keep that interaction going. A child with language impairment needs even more support, and it can be a lot of work for a parent to build a conversation with that child. As children with language impairment reach school, they enter a context where their disability will be extremely evident. Nearly every school task is conducted through the medium of language. The teacher explains rules, gives directions, and disciplines students all by talking. Students are expected to demonstrate knowledge by responding verbally to questions or probes, and the vast majority of instructional content in all subjects is conveyed via language, spoken at first, later written. Reading and writing are particularly difficult since they represent language in another form. Children who cannot speak well-formed sentences will not write them, and children who cannot understand complex verbal forms cannot be expected to recognize those forms in print. Even elementary school math quickly begins to involve verbal logic and story problems, and these usually constitute a stumbling block. Language impairment is not something we can expect children to grow out of. Rather, it tends to persist over time. The nature and symptoms of language impairment tend to change as a child matures. For example, a three, in a three-year-old, the most obvious symptom may be the fact that the child knows relatively few words and they produce immature sentences. When that same child is 13, the major manifestation of language impairment may include difficulty drawing inferences from spoken or written text, and inability to construct a coherent narrative, and problems interpreting figurative language forms. Now, to illustrate, we worked with a child I'll call Cody. We first saw Cody when he was almost five years old. He was an intelligent, outgoing child who enjoyed interacting with others. But his understanding of production and language were significantly delayed. If we asked him, what did you do this morning, Cody? He couldn't tell us. 
He had great difficulty expressing his thoughts and feelings. He could not understand verbal directions in his preschool, and he struggled with all pre-literacy tasks. Okay, now let's fast forward to Cody at age 14. Cody experienced a great deal of growth, but both his understanding and his production of language were limited compared to his peers. Cody had learned to read with great effort and a lot of help, and he enjoyed books. The fact that he even liked books was a huge blessing. Cody was enthused about the Harry Potter novels, and he read them with gusto. He understood the basic plot elements, but he had a lot of trouble drawing the social inferences. For example, Cody understood that there was a lot of animosity between two characters, Draco Malfoy and Ron Weasley. He understood that Draco and Ron couldn't stand each other. But when we asked him, why does Draco dislike Ron so much? Cody was puzzled. Now, if you're a Harry Potter geek like myself, you know that Draco is a snobby, aristocratic, rich kid who values what he views as pure bloodlines. Ron, on the other hand, comes from a poor family that doesn't really care about social class. Although Cody had picked up on the resentment between the characters, he had failed to infer what Draco frequently implied but never really stated outright, that he looked down on Ron's inclusive attitude and family poverty. Draco never said, Ron, I hate you because your family is poor and you hang out with riffraff. Draco did say things like, you don't want to go making friends with the wrong sort, or referring to a broomstick, you couldn't afford half the handle. I suppose you and your brothers have to save up twig by twig. Cody could not interpret those more subtle statements, even though he understood the words within them. What's more, Cody could not anticipate Ron's reactions to the insults. As a result, Cody's comprehension of Harry Potter novels was literal and very shallow. By definition, children with language impairment are bright, they can hear properly, and they are not considered to have clinical levels of emotional disturbance. That means there isn't any other primary condition to explain the language problems. Other terms used to refer to child language impairment include specific language impairment, developmental language disorder, or language learning disorder. Research has demonstrated that about 7% of kindergartners present with language impairment, so that's a whole lot of kids. Traditionally, research and language impairment concentrated on the linguistic manifestations of the disorder, that is, on the child's ability to produce and understand words and to build those words into grammatical sentences. Children with language impairment have difficulty learning new words quickly, and they especially struggle producing the grammatical morphemes that signal meaning and make utterances sound acceptable. They have difficulty understanding and producing sentences that express more than one idea or that express causal connections. Traditional intervention is concentrated on helping these children acquire new words and learn to produce grammatical forms and structures correctly. But early in our careers, we became interested in the pragmatic or the conversational aspects of language impairment. Basically, we wanted to focus on what happened when children with language impairment interacted with peers and adults in social interactions. Work in our field, our own and that of others, suggested that these children did not just have difficulty with the words and sentences, they also struggled to, to accommodate to their listeners in conversation. They could not use their language to respond to the questions and probes of comments of others in spontaneous conversation. We felt that this was an important component of the disorder and we wanted to focus our work there. It seemed, however, that after a brief period of interest in the more pragmatic manifestations of language impairment, the major research arm of our discipline headed in a very different direction. So this meant there were some risks to us associated with pursuing this focus. It was at this point that the Lord intervened to guide our focus in a very dramatic way. As I indicated earlier, we were working at positions where the research climate was by no means ideal, and we were desperate for the chance to pay more attention to our research. Again, against all odds, we were both offered full-time research appointments working for the University of Kansas. And that was a hotbed of research in developmental disabilities, including language impairment. We were stationed at a research satellite located in a small town in southeast Kansas. The good news was we had every day, all day, to write grants and carry out research. The bad news was we were living in a small town and we did not have access to sufficient numbers of children with language impairment to work with. We did, however, have convenient access to a different, interesting population, adults with intellectual disabilities, 
including problems communicating. Now, this was a very different population from the children with language impairment that we'd studied before, but there was something very important for us to learn from these folks. The Lord had, in essence, provided us with a population that could show us the results of years of living with communication problems and what behaviors would be important to an individual's ability to take a meaningful place in society. So we carried out fairly se uh, several fairly ambitious studies and we wanted to know what aspects of language were important to an individual's ability to live and function within a community as an adult. Well, here's what we found out. Individuals who were the best integrated within their communities were also those who could use their language, even though it was limited, to meet the needs of others in conversation. The individuals who participated most fully in their communities were those who could appreciate the needs of others. As soon as we learned this, we very unexpectedly received a pair of job offers from, job offers from BYU, and we felt called to join the faculty here. When we relocated to Provo, we finished up the studies we'd started in Kansas, and then we again focused our research on children with language impairment. But we had gained perspective that we had not had before. We could now look ahead and visualize these children as they grew up. We could appreciate how important the ability to engage in social interaction was going to be to these children we served. So we felt a heightened sense of mission to guide our focus. We wanted to know how children with language impairment use their language in social interactions, and we wanted to know what their social worlds were like. We wanted to concentrate on those things we felt would most heavily influence the quality of their lives as they grew up. Well, that seemed completely reasonable to us, but compared to most of the researchers in our field, we were swimming upstream. And we wondered, are we gonna be able to get any audience for our work? Are we ever gonna be able to get anything published? I used to say that we were on the lunatic fringe of our discipline but Martin always acted with a lot more dignity than I did. <laughs> we quickly found that the focus we had chosen was not an easy one to pursue. The behaviors we were interested in were complex and dynamic. It's not easy to figure out what goes on in conversation, especially in kids. We had to develop some rather unconventional research tasks and analysis systems. So we employed a series of probes and contexts to allow us to observe those, those moments in interaction that demand particular cooperation between speakers. Then we looked at how well children with language impairment did in those moments. As it turned out, many of them did not do very well. They had difficulty entering inter interactions with their peers. That is, they could not find themselves a place in work or play groups. They could not keep up with their peers in cooperative tasks. They had difficulty negotiating with other children. They wandered about on the school playground, hovering on the outskirts of play groups because they were unable to join in. They often seem frozen in inactivity in group player work activities, even though there were lots of things for them to do. So what were the social ramifications of these behaviors? We wanted to know about the social outcomes that children with language impairment experienced. But we were not prepared to investigate social development in children because that was way out of our area of expertise, and we needed some help. Help came in the form of collaboration with Dr. Craig Hart. Craig has deep expertise in the social development of children, and he had studied children all over the world. With Craig's help, we devised some ways to examine the social experience of children with language impairment. As you might guess, the children with language impairment had difficulty making friends, and they had difficulty being included in activities. They were lonely and isolated at school. They were withdrawn. They missed out on cooperative work activities and important learning opportunities. We found that the social worlds of many children with language impairment were just highly constricted. Our findings were corroborated by the handful of labs in the US and England that were pursuing similar studies. Let me just offer a glimpse into the social world of a child with language impairment. We conducted a study where we observed children with language impairment during their recess time at school. Each child wore a little microphone on a necklace so we could record their conversations on the playground, and we had a couple of graduate students with cameras out with the children, unobtrusively recording each child's activity. And I might add that this was not a simple proposition. At one point, our camera happened to catch an interaction among a few typically developing children. They were talking about a little girl in the first grade who had language impairment. This little girl, whom we will call Amy, was frequently withdrawn, but occasionally she was really aggressive as well. These little girls plotted together to approach Amy and to say some rude things. Subsequently, 
Subsequently, we, reserved, we observed Amy, who was sitting alone on a basketball, staring into space, doing nothing. The little girls gingerly approached Amy, and the interaction went something like this. The girls said, voices dripping with sarcasm, we really like your clothes. They then ran away laughing, evidently expecting Amy to aggress. But Amy remained stoic. The little girls approached a little bit closer this time, and again in a mocking tone. We really like your black hair. Amy did not react in any visible way. Third time they approached, closer this time, and said, We really like your brown skin. And they laughed and they ran away. Still, Amy just sat on the basketball. Then from nowhere, another little girl appeared, approached Amy and put her arm around her. This little girl tried to help Amy interpret the situation by saying gently, they're pretending to be nice to you, but they don't really like you. And then she added, but I like you. We were touched by this small act of first grade heroism, but Amy did not respond or react in any visible way. Amy was evidently unable to understand the intent of the verbal insults and she was just as unable to understand the intent of the verbally expressed love and support. She could not read the social cues and she did not respond appropriately, either to her detractors or to her advocate. Amy just seemed so totally alone. So our findings led to more questions. Why did so many children like Amy have such social problems? Well, one obvious factor was that they had limited language. Difficulty expressing oneself and understanding others would certainly have social ramifications. But we felt that the language piece did not provide the entire explanation. So we tried to take language out of the equation as much as we could. And we observed that children with language impairment had social difficulties, even in situations where we reduced the demands on their language to a bare minimum. So then we had to ask, what other factors were important? Where should we focus to find those factors? Now, in our clinical work, we observed that some children with language impairment seemed to have difficulty reading the emotional reactions of their peers. For example, one day we were watching an 11-year-old boy with language impairment work on a joint art project with two typically developing peers. And he liked these peers, and he'd played with them before. The three kids were working cooperatively on the art project, and they were doing fine when we informed them that they needed to finish up their work in a couple of minutes. At this point, the boy with language impairment experienced a little meltdown. He became agitated, and he started aggressing toward his uh, two peers. He called them bad names, he grabbed their materials, he put glue on their heads, pushed them around, that kind of thing. The two other children became very quiet and their faces clouded up noticeably. The boy's behavior shocked us because he was really a very nice kid. But here's what really worried us. After the interaction, the boy had no idea that his peers were upset with him because of his behavior. He was unaware of the emotional reaction that his aggressive behavior evoked. Evidently, he could not read his peers' social cues, he could not read their silence, their facial expression, their body language. We'd occasionally seen this kind of thing before in children with language impairment, so we wondered if emotional learning or emotional intelligence might be a factor. This was more of a passing notion, however, until Martin went to the temple one afternoon. During the session, he had the distinct thought, look at emotion. In another temple session, I had a series of less well-organized thoughts. I thought, the spirit teaches through emotion. Negative emotion blocked the spirit. Emotion is important. Emotion is how we learn. Well, now we had a refined focus. The role of emotion in the social competence of children with language impairment. The problem was we lacked the expertise to develop this focus because we didn't know anything about emotion or emotional intelligence. Again, we needed help. Help came in the form of Dr. Matt Spackman, then a professor in psychology at BYU. Matt is an expert in emotion, and he taught us a great deal. Even better, he collaborated with us in developing several studies to look at various aspects of emotional intelligence in children. These studies were very tricky to conduct because we had to find probes and measures and tasks that could circumvent the kids' language problems in order for us to examine their knowledge of emotion. And this was not easy. We did find, however, that compared to their typically developing peers, children with language impairment had trouble with several aspects of emotional intelligence. For one thing, they had difficulty regulating their emotion. There are two sides to the emotion regulation coin. On one side is the ability to use external and internal resources to calm oneself in stressful situations. For example, 
A child who's afraid to enter a new preschool may go sit in her mom's lap for a minute to reassure, to reassure herself till she feels a little better. If a, another example, if a child is frightened in a scary movie, he might tell himself, it's not real, it's just ketchup, it's not really blood. <laughs> Sometimes we try to teach children strategies to regulate themselves in, in the face of negative emotion. If a child is angry, you might say something like, take a deep breath, count to 10, give it a minute, something like that. On the other side of the emotion regulation coin is the ability to gear oneself up to do a challenging task. This is what a child does when he really doesn't want to practice the piano, but he girds, girds up his loins and he just does it anyway. Another example might be a child who wants to join in a game on the playground, but she has to get up the gumption to ask to enter the play. We used to teach a report measure to consider both sides of the emotion regulation coin in children with language impairment. We found that these children had particular difficulty with the gearing up aspect of emotion. They just had trouble gearing themselves up to do things. Now this finding fit very well with our previous finding that children with language impairment were reticent or withdrawn at school. This helped us explain why they so often seemed immobilized even when there was plenty to do. The emotion regulation piece was important in explaining their reticence. Well, we probed several other aspects of emotional intelligence as well. We found that compared to their typically developing peers, Seven to nine-year-old children with language impairment had difficulty recognizing emotions conveyed by facial expression. Even if they knew the emotion words, they were not as accurate uh, in labeling the emotions they saw in faces. They would do okay recognizing very basic emotions like happy, mad, or sad, but they str really struggled with emotions like scared, frightened, surprised, disgusted. We looked at another aspect of emotional intelligence, the ability to understand emotion conveyed by a person's prosody or tone of voice. Now let me give a little example. If we hear someone comment, oh, that's lovely, let's hope we see more of that. And we're gonna think the speaker is pleased. If we hear the same person say, well, that's lovely, let's hope we see more of that. We will interpret both the emotion and the intent of the speaker very differently. We found that children with language impairment had difficulty interpreting the emotion conveyed of tone of voice. We found the same thing when we had them listen to passages of music that expressed emotion they just did not do as well as their typically developing peers. We also looked at how well children with language impairment could infer the emotion that another person might experience in a given situation. We presented children with scenarios like the following. We said, this is Chris. Chris has a goldfish. Chris really likes his goldfish. One day, Chris's goldfish dies. Chris feels, then we had the child finish the sentence. Once again, children with language impairment had a harder time than their typically developing peers. It was just more difficult for them to appreciate how a person might feel in a specific situation. So we decided to push the emotion understanding envelope a little farther. We wondered how well children with language impairment understood the need to hide their emotional reactions in certain situations. This behavior is called emotional dissemblance and it's important to getting along socially. Basically, one can't always blurt out how one feels in a social situation. For example, let's say you invite a new neighbor to your home for dinner. You prepare your best lasagna and bring it to the table. The neighbor takes one look at the lasagna and explains, that looks disgusting, I hate lasagna. Your neighbor may be expressing a perfectly honest emotion, but we have emotion display rules in our culture that dictate that one does not tell one's hostess that her food is disgusting, even if it is because this could hurt her feelings and be damaging to the relationship. But how do kids learn when they should hide their emotions? This is a gradual process as parents and teachers help kids learn to anticipate and be sensitive to the feelings of others. So we designed some tasks to, to uh, probe the semblance of emotion here again in seven to nine year old children with language impairment and their typically developing peers. For example, we showed the children a picture like this and said, this is Chris. This is Chris's favorite Uncle Bob. Chris gets to eat dinner at Uncle Bob's house. Uncle Bob makes chocolate cake. He gives Chris a big piece of chocolate cake. Chris takes a bite of the cake. The cake tastes really nasty. And then we asked the child a series of questions. First we asked, how did the cake taste? Now we asked this question to make sure that the child understood the scenario. Then we asked, how does Chris feel? 
We wanted to assure that the child understood that Chris would experience some kind of negative emotion when he tasted the yucky cake. And then we asked, what should Chris say? We were probing here whether the child thought Chris should hide his emotion from his Uncle Bob. And then we followed up with, what would Chris's parents want him to do? We asked this question to probe the child's understanding of display rules. Almost all of the children with language impairment and the typically developing children understood that Chris was going to experience some negative emotion when he tasted that yucky cake. But the what should Chris say question was harder as the ability to assemble was still developing even in some of the typical children. Still, children with language impairment indicated that Chris should dissemble or hide his emotions significantly less often than did the typically developing kids. In response to the last question, what would Chris's parents want him to do? The groups did not differ. Most kids said something like, just say thank you, or just eat it, or just eat a, just eat a little bite more. So although most of the kids knew that Chris's parents would want him to conceal his emotion, the children with language impairment were not as likely to think that that knowledge should actually inform Chris's behavior. So we could say that although children with language impairment knew what the cultural display rules were, they were not as likely to adhere to those rules. In other words, they knew what Chris would be expected to do, but they didn't necessarily think he needed to do it. Now, why do we even care about all these aspects of emotional intelligence and what difference could it possibly make? Well, remember that children with language impairment often experience poor social outcomes such as few friendships, loneliness, rejection, and victimization as they grow up. We've known this for a while, but we have not understood why. It looks like weaknesses in emotional intelligence constitute an important factor in explaining these difficulties. And if this is the case, then we need to incorporate social emotional learning into our intervention programs for children with language impairment. And we need to do it in such a way that we can facilitate the child's ability to understand and produce language at the same time that we build his emotion knowledge. So now our task is to figure out what kinds of intervention approaches and procedures and activities are going to be the most effective. And that's what we're working on right now. 30 odd years ago when we started out, our field did not know very much at all about the social and emotional manifestations of language impairment. Now we know more. We don't know nearly enough, but we know a lot more than we did. Martin and I feel strongly that through a quiet whisper in the temple, we were directed to pursue this rather odd focus within our discipline because it was important. We feel that it was our job to help bring this lunatic fringe work into the mainstream of thought within our field. And that is exactly what has happened. We hope that this focus will lead to more effective treatments that will make life a lot better for children who literally cannot speak for themselves. Focus the work as another small and simple principle with profound implications. The third small and simple principle has to do with insights that we receive in our personal professional lives. Now, we never attended BYU as a student, so the, before we joined the faculty here, we were not aware of the aims of a BYU education. When we came here, I was particularly intrigued with the first two aims that education be, should be spiritually strengthening and intellectually enlarging. And as I thought about these, I thought, these two aims ought to merge in an ideal world. Put another way, it seems to us that we should let our academic learning inform our spiritual learning, and our spiritual learning inform our academic learning. And we think about this as letting insight flow both ways simultaneously. This principle works particularly well in a field like speech language pathology where we interface in the lives of individuals with disabilities. For all speech language pathologists, the work that we do is filtered through the values, value system that we embrace. And as we teach our students, there's no such thing as a clinical Switzerland. No morally neutral approach to treatment, whether we are religious or not. The way that we approach any individual in treatment reflects how we view the world and what we value the most. As Latter-day Saints, our spiritual insights suggest that one of the most important things we do in this mortal existence is to build relationships. After all, we let the relationships we form shape our quality of life here and go with us after we leave this mortal life. This insight informs our intervention approach. Now, as you might expect, there are many ways to design intervention for children with language impairment and lots of programs and procedures available. We feel that it is a spiritual insight that guides us to seek out and develop practical methods to help children with language impairment develop the emotional 
and language competence that will allow them to form and maintain positive relationships. But insight can flow both ways. Often, what we understand about our disciplines can inform our spiritual knowledge as well. And let me give an example. Right now, Martin and I, along with our research team of students, are trying to design and test out intervention methods for children with language impairment. As I've indicated, what we want to do is to target aspects of social emotional learning explicitly at the same time that we build language content and structure. But as always happens in the mortal existence, obstacles arise and we just face a lot of challenges. Basically, we're asking these kids to work on the areas that are the very most difficult for him and that is not a walk in the park. We've do, we have time and resource constraints. We have elected not to work with children in a more idealistic uh, clinic room for extended periods of time. Rather, we are working within the limits of the public school setting. Now, that means that we can see children twice a week for 20, week, for 20 minutes. So just twice a week in 20 minute sessions at the most at their school. That is not a lot of instructional time in which to affect change, but that is the reality. We have carefully laid out our goals and devised treatment activities to adhere to achieve those goals. And the activities we've designed are really hard work for these kids, but we've been able to keep them engaged for the most part. The most difficult part of the project is finding reliable and valid ways to measure growth and progress. We can easily administer measures that tell us that the children, that the children we're working with are not typical. We can easily see the gaps between their levels of functioning and those of their peers and we do not expect that those gaps are gonna narrow quickly. Finding what is wrong is easy. Finding what is changing is much more difficult. We need reliable tasks that we can administer repeatedly to probe what children are learning, and we have very little time in which to administer those tasks or we have no time for teaching. Sounds a little like the current national debate, doesn't it? We feel that it is a rule of thumb in assessment that the more meaningful the behavior is, the more difficult it is to measure. We can quite easily determine if a child can point to an object we name, but how can we really evaluate what a child understands within a given social context? The methods of assessment that we have devised are plagued by an assortment of problems. Children get bored with the materials we use. On any given day, children may have had a bad experience of recess. They might be really tired. They may be hungry. They may be excited about a party. They may be distracted by a rainstorm. There might be a fire drill. Any and all of these factors wreak havoc with our assessment probes. Sometimes children do poorly on probe tasks even when we have seen day-to-day -day evidence that they understand the concepts. And sometimes when children are learning new things, they are simply inconsistent in their performance. At other times, however, we see moments when they show particular growth and insight, but our probes rarely capture such instances. And it is so frustrating. Let me offer an example. We worked with a six-year-old girl I will call Jenny. Jenny presented with marked language impairment. She also had attentional issues, a number of challenging behaviors. School was very hard for her as she lacked the language to understand much of the instruction. She struggled with literacy tasks. She couldn't sit still. She often acted out. In addition, Jenny's emotion knowledge was very immature. When we first met her, she could not recognize the label basic emotions. In addition, Jenny was often withdrawn and reticent around her classmates. So we started Jenny in our little intervention program. On a day-to-day -day basis, working with Jenny was an adventure. Her behavior was highly inconsistent. Some days, she liked a storybook we were using. Other days, she ran a room, around the room screaming, no books, no books. Sometimes, she would sit and work. Other days, she tantrum, crawled under the table, tried to escape through the door. It was a constant battle to keep Jenny engaged in our short sessions. In assessing Jenny's performance on any given day, we had to consider her personal world, and that world was often in a state of confusion or flux. We had to make second-to-second -second adjustments in our treatment procedures just to keep her engaged. Despite the challenges of everyday therapy sessions, however, Jenny made some progress. Apparently, she was listening, even when she was crawling under the table or throwing things around the room. In our post-testing, she was able to identify and label more emotions. And that was great, because we had a probe that could document that behavior. On other probes, however, such as retelling a story, Jenny did not show any change at all. When we tried to evaluate this skill, 
Jenny let us know that she was not at all interested in the book we were using in our probe, and she was done with that. But Jenny also had some important moments that our assessments just couldn't capture. During one session, we presented a story to Jenny where a character experienced an adverse event and felt sad. Jenny considered the scenario, and then she spontaneously related how she'd recently seen another child in a similar situation on the playground. Jenny went on to say that she had approached the distressed child and tried to make her feel better. Whoa, Jenny, who previously did not understand facial expressions of emotion, who previously had withdrawn from her peers, Jenny had recognized that a classmate was sad and had tried to intervene to make things better. This was golden, but not something that our assessment probes could document. Golden moments like that are hard to capture even within single subject, multiple baseline research designs. Jenny's case shows us how difficult it is to measure growth and progress in the areas that really matter the most. What we learned from working with Jenny offered us some important spiritual insights. Jenny had a lot going on in her life and her behavior was highly inconsistent. She could not be judged on any given day on the basis of how she had behaved the day before. Jenny's behavior was often challenging but she was employing new emotional knowledge and language ability to enact small acts of heroism. We could never really know what it felt like to be Jenny. We could only guess. In assessing Jenny's behavior, we were reminded that only the Lord really knows what is inside of us. Only he can truly evaluate or judge our behavior in any situation. Only the Lord knows our personal context and our understanding. Only the Lord can know a person's intentions or evaluate a person's behavior. Only the, only the Lord can assess each person's progress. No wonder the Savior instructed us, judge not that ye be not judged. So of course, it was going to be difficult and challenging for us to evaluate Jenny's ability to measure her growth. We will need to think hard about this and try some new things. Although it will be tricky to evaluate Jenny, we can be flexible and creative in anticipating your needs, and we can try to create context where she can perform to the best of her abilities. We can find and create the situations in which she can thrive. We can be patient with her difficulties, and we can teach her as much as we can. And we must always give Jenny another day and another chance to learn. Always. How often, we have wondered, do we look like Jenny to our Heavenly Father? Figuratively speaking, we might tantrum, throw things around the room, bolt for the door. Sometimes, however, we have golden moments when we are capable of quiet acts of heroism. Only the Lord can measure our progress and growth, and only through the atonement of Jesus Christ can our golden moments come to the forefront and our challenging behaviors recede. And like Jenny, don't we always need another day and another chance to learn? Always? Isn't this really the essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, to be a disciple scholar in our time is a call to high adventure. Even in a field as service-oriented and non-controversial as speech-language pathology, we have found this to be the case. To the extent that we have been able to negotiate the scholarly waters, the three small and simple principles have made it possible for us. Trust in the Lord has brought miracles into our personal and our professional lives. Focusing our work has allowed us to prioritize and concentrate our efforts. And letting insight flow both ways has enriched our understanding of both temporal and spiritual concepts. It is a joy and an honor to be part of the faculty at Brigham Young University where we can let these principles have full sway. Thank you.